What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. When you look at the book of Revelation, one of the major topics in Revelation is this conflict over worship, conflict between righteousness and unrighteousness, conflict between truth and error. And at the heart of that conflict is a crisis over worship. There are two signs in the book of Revelation, the seal of God and the mark of the beast. And in this presentation, we're going to probe both. What is the mark of the beast? What is the seal of God? And how can we avoid the mark of the beast? Let's pray as we enter into this most significant, vitally important presentation. Father in heaven, reveal to us clearly your truth. Help us to see the truth of your word, and may it make a difference in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. The title of this program is Revelation's Mark of the Beast Exposed. This is part of a series of telecasts called Revelation's Ancient Discoveries aired here on Three Angels Broadcasting. When I was asked to do this series on the book of Revelation, I knew that one of the key topics was the one we're going to be presenting right now, Revelation's Mark of the Beast Exposed. Many people are quite confused about the Mark of the Beast. They have the idea that it is 666 branded on somebody's forehead. And so they've often said, as I've lectured on the book of Revelation, I don't want anybody, I'm not going to let anybody brand 666 on my forehead. Much more subtle than that. Some have felt that maybe it's the barcode on cans or that which we scan on consumer goods. And they've said, you know, that has to do with 666, a time when you cannot buy or sell. But we need to go to Revelation itself and discover some basic things like who is the beast? What is the mark of the beast? And how can you avoid the mark of the beast? The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we study this issue of the beast power and discover who the beast is, we want to be sure that Jesus is central. Whoever the beast is, whatever the beast power is, whatever that antichrist power is, it's something opposite of who Christ is. It teaches teachings not in harmony with Jesus. So Jesus is always front and center in the book of Revelation. But Revelation reveals Jesus' truth and exposes Satan's deceptions. If there is a pathology or a sickness in the human body, it's not always pleasant to have a diagnosis by a physician that you're sick. Let's suppose you had cancer. And let's suppose that you needed a diagnosis before treatment, which of course you would. And let's suppose in that diagnosis, the cancer was worse than you thought, but the physician said, if you have a very painful operation, I know that we can, that cancer can be removed. We can get it. It has not yet metastasized. The growth is growing. We need to cut it out. You and I wouldn't look forward to surgery, but we would look forward to saving our life. Sometimes in life, you have to go through things that are quite painful for the ultimate result of saving your life. So the subject of the mark of the beast is not a pleasant one at times to discuss because we're looking at some long cherished religious opinions. And I want to do this as kindly, as lovingly as I can. But wouldn't you expect me as a preacher of the word of God to share truth with you even at times if that truth were painful, if it could save your very life. Revelation 13 verse 1 says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like 
a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The waters which you saw. Now, what are, you see this beast comes up out of the water. So let's pause here for a moment. We have to let Revelation describe its own symbols. So remember the beast comes up out of the water. What do the waters represent? Revelation 17, verse 15. The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, or tongues. We've studied about that harlot, that false religious system in Revelation 17. But what do the waters represent? They represent peoples. So a beast coming up out of the sea, like we saw in Revelation 13 that we just read, represents something, a power, coming up out of a peopled area of the world, uh, out of a population base, not of an area that is not populated. So in Bible prophecy, we look at the symbols, and the symbols explain themselves. Waters represent people. They re we sometimes use the expression, the great sea of humanity. And so it's a very common symbol. Now in the book of Revelation, in, not only in Revelation, but throughout Bible prophecy, what does a beast represent? A beast represents a king or a kingdom. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth what? Kingdom on earth. When you read these prophetic symbols, they are quite uh, common throughout Scripture, and they're consistent. You read about a beast representing a king or a kingdom in the book of Daniel. You carry that over to the book of Revelation. A beast represents a king or a kingdom. So the beast coming up out of the sea represents a kingdom arising in a populated area of the world. So a beast represents a, a political power or it could represent a political religious power, but something that has authority. Now, the, where does this new power get its authority from? Revelation 13 verse 2, the dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. So his throne of rulership comes from the dragon. This is Revelation 13. If you go back to Revelation, the 12th chapter, you'll notice something about this dragon. In Daniel chapter 7, you have four beasts. You have a lion with eagle's wings, Babylon. You have a bear with three ribs, Medo-Persia. You have a Greece with the leopard-like beast uh, describing Greece. And then you have this really nondescript dragon-like beast representing Rome. So back in Daniel 7, the fourth beast represents Rome. The beast that comes up in Revelation 13 is this composite beast. You remember how it read, I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw another beast come up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, upon his head the name of blasphemy. The beast which you saw was like unto a what? Leopard, there you see it. Feet like the feet of a what? Bear. Mouth like the mouth of a what? Lion and the dragon. See, again, it's describing the Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome of Daniel 7. There's another interesting aspect of this dragon's work. You look at Revelation 12, verse 4 and 5. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. So now this is the dragon in Revelation 12. Who do they represent? To devour her child as soon as it was born. So the dragon to devour the child. Who's the child? Child is Jesus, of course. And uh, who's the dragon in Revelation chapter 12? It says the dragon which you saw is Satan. So how do you harmonize the dragon being Satan and the dragon being pagan Rome? Satan always works through some earthly power. So in Revelation 12, the dragon is working through pagan Rome to destroy Jesus. In Revelation 12, the dragon Satan is bent on destroying Christ. Now remember, it was a Roman official, Herod, that passed a decree that all male children be killed. The dragon, Satan, working through pagan Rome to destroy Jesus. It was a Roman governor, Pilate, that sentenced Christ to death and ordered his crucifixion. Again, the dragon, Satan, working through pagan Rome to destroy Jesus. 
You look again, it was a Roman emblem that sealed Jesus' tomb and Roman soldiers that guarded it. Again, the dragon working through pagan Rome to destroy Jesus. So when you come to Revelation 13 and you see the dragon gave the power and great authority to this beast coming up, this new power that's rising in Revelation 13, you have to raise a question. Since in Daniel 7, the dragon-like beast, nondescript beast, is pagan Rome. Since in Revelation 12, the Satan works through pagan Rome. Who did pagan Rome give its power, throne, and great authority to? Let's go to history. We'll find six identifying characteristics of this beast power that leave no question, no shadow of a doubt what the beast power is. First, it gets, it, gets its authority from pagan Rome. Professor LeBlanca, the professor of history in the University of Rome, said this, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, now this is Professor LeBlanca, professor of history, University of Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. What did Revelation chapter 13 say? That this beast power would get its seat of government, its authority from pagan Rome. So who got its authority from pagan Rome? It was, of course, papal Rome of the pontiff. So the beast power identified here in Revelation 13 uh, would have to be papal Rome because it got its seat of government from pagan Rome. The pontiffs sat there in the throne of the emperors or the Caesars. Uh, Stanley's History, page 40, again we go to history, says this, the popes filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting again their power, prestige, and titles from paganism. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. This is not a preacher, this is Stanley's history. Now let me assure you, the beast is not a person. The Bible doesn't say the beast is a person. The beast is always a power, a political power or a religious power. It is a religious political system. Let me pause as well here. In our ancient discovery systems on series on the book of Revelation, in our Revelation's ancient discovery series, it's not our goal to condemn, blaspheme any religious organization. There are many wonderful, wonderful, godly people in the Roman Catholic community. I was brought up in a lovely Catholic home. My mom was Roman Catholic and I was educated by the priests and the nuns for much of my life, the first eight years of my education. And I look back at that with deep thanksgiving. One of the things that I really appreciate is learning to memorize. My Catholic Roman, teach, Roman Catholic teachers, my nuns, really taught me how to memorize a great deal. So I thank God for that. And I, I remember the first time I heard a message like this. It really tore me apart inside. But you know, when you look at Scripture, you have to say, I don't want to go the easy way. You have to say, what is truth? And if this is clear truth, I want to follow it. So let's look at the identifying characteristics of this beast power. Then let's look at the mark of the beast. Let's look at the seal of God and try to put all that together tonight. The beast of Revelation 13 describes a religious political power system that would grow up out of Rome after the fall of the Roman Empire. Now notice another characteristic, Revelation 13:8 all who dwell on the earth will worship him. In other words, it is a system of religious authority or worship. It talks about all over the world there would be this worldwide religious power. So whoever the beast power is of Revelation 13, it can't be something done in a corner. It's not an individual. It's a political religious system that spans the globe. There's another characteristic of this power as well. Revelation 13 verse 5 said he was given a mouth speaking great things in blasphemy. According to the Bible, what is blasphemy? How does the Bible itself define blasphemy? 
What does the Bible say that blasphemy is? Jesus was charged with blasphemy. He certainly wasn't a blasphemer. But John 10, verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you being a man make yourself God. So any human being that claims the authority of God is indeed a blasphemer, because blasphemy is when a human being claims authority of God. Does the Roman church make that claim? One must be fair with history, and so let's go to the original sources. In encyclical letters of Leo XIII, of course, Pope, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Another aspect of blasphemy is found in Mark 2, verse 7. Again, the Pharisees, scribes say, religious leaders of Judaism, why does this man, Jesus, speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they're claiming Christ is a blasphemer. Why? Because he has the power to forgive sins. Was Jesus a blasphemer? No, not at all. Why not? Because he was God and therefore could claim the power to forgive sins. But yet, any earthly power that would claim the power to forgive sins would enter into what the Bible calls blasphemy. In the book, The Dignities and Duties of the Priest, we read this sentence. And this is volume 12, page 2. Dignities and Duties of the Priest is a book that priests get to study their responsibilities as a priest for the priesthood. God himself, this is amazing, God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priest and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. Again, I let you judge for yourself. The Bible says blasphemy is claiming to be equal with God. Does the church do that? They claim to. The Bible says blasphemy is claiming the power to forgive sins. You've seen the clear statement. I need not comment on it. Honest hearted people, guided by the Spirit, hear the call of God to their hearts and want to step out from falsehood and tradition. Jesus is our only priest. And I remember a time when my mother was sitting in the backyard of our home there in Norwich, Connecticut, and I came out in the back. It was a hot, sunny July day. I had come to Jesus. I had heard and understood these truths, and I so wanted to share them with Mom. My dad had already accepted them, came out on the back porch, and I said, you know, Mom, when I was taught in catechism, I was taught that I needed a priest because the priest would be a mediator between God and me, that I was not good enough to approach God. But mother, let me read you a Bible text. And I read her, 1 Timothy, where it says, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And I noticed tears come in her eyes because she began to understand, maybe for the first time in her life, the all supremacy of Christ. We are not good enough to appear before God. We need a priest, but Jesus is our priest. So here are three characteristics of the beast power. They have authority. The beast power gets authority from pagan Rome. Papal Rome did. It is a worldwide religious power. Papal Rome is. It claims equality with God. Papal Rome does. But notice, Revelation 13, verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. In other words, during the Middle or Dark Ages, church and state would unite, and this power would become a persecuting power. Did church and state unite under Rome? and persecute those that didn't go along with its teachings? There's only one answer to that. You look at history, and certainly the answer is yes. This would be a persecuting power during the Dark or Middle Ages. There is a fifth uh, characteristic. It says, Revelation 13, verse 5, He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, in other words, the power to forgive sins, is exalting one's authority above the authority of God, and he was given authority to continue 42 months. Now, what's that all about? Authority to continue 42 months. Here is mathematical proof of this identity. 
In Bible prophecy, one prophetic day equals one literal year. You read that in Ezekiel 4, verse 6, Numbers 14, and verse 34. He says, I've given you one day for a year. Now, every time you read about a day in Bible prophecy, in, in the Bible, rather, it's not a year. But when you read about it in Bible prophecy, it is a symbol. You have symbolic prophecy. You have beasts coming up out of the sea. You have like a lion with eagle's wings, nothing like that in natural phenomena. You have a bear raising itself up on one side with three ribs in its mouth. You have these symbols. You have the leopard with four heads and the wings and this dragon-like beast. And then you have time prophecy in the context of those symbols. And so where you have symbolic prophecy, you have symbolic time prophecy as well. So one prophetic day equals a year. So in the Bible, there are 30 days in a prophetic month. So this powered rain for 42 months or 1260 prophetic days or 1260 literal years. What is that all about? The papal power rose to its ascendancy when Vigilus II was crowned by Justinian, the pagan Roman emperor, there in 538 AD. Now before that time, the last of the barbarian or the Aryan tribes were driven out of Rome. And uh, here the significance of this date is papal authority is given at this point. The papacy ruled for 1260 years. Certainly there was the Reformation during this time with Luther and Zwingli and Huss and Jerome and the other Reformers. But if you take 260 years and you add it to A.D. 538, you come to A.D. 1798. What happened in A.D. 1798? The Bible is very, very plain. Napoleon, looking down to the south, sees the Pope of Rome as a rival. And so he sends his general, he actually sent him the year earlier. But the general came back empty-handed. He goes down in 1798, it's Berthier, exactly in that year that Bible prophecy predicted. Berthier, General Berthier, enters Rome, takes the papacy captive during that time, takes the pope captive. The pope actually dies in captivity. There are a number of rivals that rival that, that battle for the papacy, and that's an interesting history in itself. But here's the point, that in 1798, the Pope is taken captive. What does history tell us about these remarkable events? Church history, page 24. The murder of a Frenchman in Rome in 1798 gave the French an excuse for occupying the Eternal City and putting an end to the papal temporal power. The aged pontiff himself was carried into exile into Valencia. The enemies of the church rejoiced. They thought, of course, the last pope, they declared, has resigned. So 538 AD, French put a crown on the king. The, pig, the emperor Justinian enables the king, rather, enables the pope to sit upon his throne and uh, gives him civil authority at that time. Then 1798 occurs. What takes place? Napoleon sends his French general down. He overthrows Rome, takes the Pope captive. So from 538 to 1798, the receiving of authority, the removing of authority, exactly like the Bible says in that 1260-year period. Now, what does the Bible say about this? Let's look at it very carefully. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. In fact, that's what many people thought, that the papacy was mortally wounded. And his deadly wound would eventually, of course, be healed, and all the world would marvel or follow the beast again. So the Bible predicted that the Pope would go into captivity. It would be a deadly wound, but that deadly wound would be healed, and the Pope eventually would achieve worldwide prominence or authority again. So here are five characteristics, five identifying characteristics of the beast power of Revelation chapter 13. It would get its authority from pagan Rome. It did. It would be a worldwide religious power. It was. It would claim equality with God. It indeed did. It was a persecuting power during those dark ages. It was. It would reign for 1260 years, exactly historically like the Bible says. But there is another identifying characteristic found in Revelation 13 verse 18. It says, here's wisdom. 
Let him who has understanding calculate or compute the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man and his number is 666. So when you look at that, it says, let's calculate. Now, I want to here be sure we understand. 666 is not the only identification of the beast. In fact, if we didn't have 666, we could still easily identify the beast from those five characteristics outlined in Revelation 13. But it does help to confirm that identity. Now, in the Bible prophecy, of course, seven equals perfection. The six equals apostasy or rebellion throughout Scripture. One of the official titles of the papacy is Vicarius Filiae Dei, or Vicar, the Son of God. This is one of the very authoritative, one of the official titles of the papacy, Vicarius Filiae Dei. In fact, it's one of the most exalted titles because it means Vicar, the Son of God. If you take Vicarius Filiae Dei and you compute that in Roman numerals, and of course, in the days of John, you had the use of these Roman numerals. And Roman numerals are a very common symbol or common system of computation. V would equal 5, I would equal 1, C would equal 100, A would equal 0, R would equal 0, 1 would equal, I would equal 1, U, that's the same as V, that would equal 5, S would equal 0. So you just have 5 and 1 and 101 and 5, that is 112. Then F, filier, would equal 0, I would equal 1, L would equal 50, I would equal 1 and I would equal 1. Again, you've got 53. D in the Dei, Vicarius, Vicar, the son of Filiae, Dei, God. D would equal 500, E will equal 0, and I would equal 1. That's 501. If you add them up, 112, 53, and 501. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding calculate or compute the number of the beast. It's the number of his name, and that is the number of a man. So notice the name or title of the papacy, Vicarius Filiae Dei. You'll get two and three and one, that's six. One and five and zero, that's six. And five and one is six, so you have six, six, six. So the beast power outlined in Revelation chapter 13 is a religious power. It's a power that would rise out of Rome and exert religious authority. Now notice what scripture says. Each of these identifying characteristics must be present. They are, of course, in the papacy. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. What is this talking about? The mark of papal authority. The mark of papal authority that would be enforced at a time of universal crisis, famine, fire, flood, earthquake, hurricane, natural disaster, war, conflict, strife, economic disaster. So around the world, the Bible teaches that before the coming of Jesus, there would be great disaster. And the human race would look for a single world ruling authority to bring human beings together to bring peace back to the world under the auspices of the sign or mark of that authority. Now, in Bible prophecy, what is indeed this mark of the beast? To understand the mark of the beast, we must first understand God's sign, seal, or mark. In the book of Revelation, you have both the mark of the beast and the seal of God. So you can't fully understand the mark of the beast unless you understand the seal of God. So in Revelation 7, verse 2 and 3, it says, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. So what is this seal of the living God? Then the angel says, Hurt not the earth or the sea until we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Now notice, he cries with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. In other words, hold the strife back. 
hold the destruction back, hold the calamity, the conflict back until something happens, till we've sealed the servants of God. Where? In their fort. It's saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we've sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Did you notice something interesting? The mark of the beast is received either in the forehead or in the hand, the seal of God only in the forehead. We'll understand that why shortly. So what is God saying here? He's saying, before the mark of the beast goes forth, I want my people to receive my seal, the seal that they are mine, the seal that I own them, the seal that they belong to me, the seal that they are the creators. The mark of the beast is enforced either in the hand or in the forehead. The forehead is a sign of the brain. It's a sign of conscience, reason, and judgment. It's a symbol of the intellect, the forebrain. So the devil either deceived people by the millions into following him in their mind, whereas the hand is a symbol of force, coercion, power. So the devil doesn't care if he deceives you like the serpent or he forces or coerces you like the dragon and says you can't buy or sell and there's this economic boycott or there's this death decree. The devil doesn't care which way he gets you. God never appeals to us through force or coercion, but he only appeals to us through truth and love. The devil can use force and fear. The, Jesus only uses love and truth. Forehead means you're convicted it's right. The hand means you're converse to go along, you're, you're coerced to go along with it. Jesus only appeals to our logic. God never, ever uses force. He wins us by love. Now, what is this seal? What's another name for the seal? Romans 4, verse 11. Talking about Abraham, he received the sign of circumcision or a seal of righteousness. In the Bible, a sign or a seal is the same thing. A seal authenticates a document. Where do we find God's eternal code of conduct? Of course, in his law. So the Holy Spirit, which is the sealing agency, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, grieve not the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit seals in your heart loyalty to Christ, seals in your heart commitment to God's law. The Holy Spirit places within you that power, that strength, that desire to serve Christ and Him alone. Look, Isaiah 8 verse 16, seal the law among my disciples. So God's seal is found in His law. The Holy Spirit seals the law in our hearts or in our lives. What's another name for seal? It's sign. Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them. So God's Sabbath is his sign or his seal of ownership and authority. In all of the Ten Commandment law, there's only one commandment that tells us why we keep the commandments. You read the commandment, it says, honor your father and mother. Why should you do that? I mean, it's the right thing to do, yes. Thou shalt not kill, why not? Thou shalt not steal, why not? Don't commit adultery, don't cover it, why not? Don't have any other gods before you, why not? Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain, why not? No images, why not? Why not? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor into all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, for the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Why not? because God created you, because God fashioned you. Revelation 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. So the Sabbath is the symbol of the Creator God. It's the symbol that we belong to Him. It's the symbol of His ownership. So the seal of God is really the Holy Spirit placing within our heart and mind the desire to be loyal to Christ. 666 symbolizes man's rebellion in changing God's law, which is his sign, his seal, or his mark of authority. Now, royal seals were commonly used throughout the Old and New Testament period. Royal seals always would have the name of the sealer, 
the title of the sealer and his territory. So if you have a royal seal for Constantine, for example, it would say name Constantine, title, emperor, and territory, Roman Empire. If you had a seal of the United States for, say, Abraham Lincoln, it would say name Abraham Lincoln, title, president, his domain or territory, United States. So seals were commonly used to authenticate a document. Even now, if you go down to a justice of the peace, if you go down to a notary public, you have a seal. You have an, inform, uh, an important document, bring it down to the notary, and the notary will put their seal on it. The seal will have the name of the notary, it'll have the title of the notary, and it will also have the territory of that notary. Now, God's seal in his law, the Sabbath, has his name, his title, and his territory. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So what's his name? It's the Lord thy God. What is his function? It is creator, the one who made. And what's his territory? Heaven and earth. Look, for in six days the Lord, that's his name, made. He's, that's his title. He's the maker, the creator the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, that's his territory. And he rested the seventh day. So the Holy Spirit leads us to conversion. The Holy Spirit is the sealing agency. The Holy Spirit writes the law of God in our mind so we know it, in our heart so we love it. The Holy Spirit then places within our hearts the desire to follow Christ. The Sabbath becomes the visible symbol that we desire through His grace to be loyal and committed to Him. He has blessed the Sabbath day and He's hallowed it. It is His divine seal in the last days of earth's history. At a time when there's war, terrorism, conflict, strife on every hand, God has a group of people that will stand for Him. On the other hand, there will be this mass ecumenical movement to bring people together to have world peace. God's seal, his name, the Lord your God, his title, the creator, his territory, heaven and earth. He is gathering men and women under his banner to serve him. He says in Ezekiel 20 verse 20, how are my Sabbaths? And they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God just as the Sabbath is the sign of God, just like a seal was the sign of the ancient king, the ancient emperor, the ancient ruler. The Sabbath is God's sign of loyalty, God's sign of faithfulness, God's sign that he indeed is the creator and we want to worship him. The central issue regarding the mark of the beast is worship. Whose shrine will we worship at? Will we worship at the shrine of man or the shrine of Jesus? Whose authority will we accept? The authority of man, the authority of Jesus. The, it's not a matter of days, my friend, simply. It's a matter of allegiance. It's a matter of loyalty. It's a matter of a conflict over the law of God, a conflict between the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Now, what does the Church of Rome claim is the sign of its authority? What does the Church of Rome claim that it's the sign of its authority? Notice, in the Catholic record, September 1, 1923, I read, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So what does the church itself claim that is its mark of authority? Of course, Sunday. Now, somebody says, Pastor Mark, please make this plain. Does everybody who keeps Sunday have the mark of the beast? Not at all. Let me repeat that. Everyone who keeps Sunday does not have the mark of the beast. There are so many conscientious Christians. They're Catholic Christians. They're Baptist Christians. They're Pentecostal Christians. They're Lutheran Christians. They are non-denominational Christians. I meet them everywhere. They love Jesus. They're totally committed to Christ. And they do not have the mark of the beast by keeping Sunday. But look, in the future, church and state will unite. In the future, at the time of crisis, when this world appears to be falling apart, 
in an attempt to unite all the world, a decree will be passed leading people to worship on the first day of the week. Denominational differences will be dropped for the sake of political unity and the sake of trying to save the world. Now that doesn't mean that each religious denomination is going to blend into one, but they will find at least two points in common. One, Sunday worship, and second, the idea of the soul being immortal. And they'll be led on those two points in this great unity movement. But God will have a people, a people that are loyal to him, a people that are faithful to him, a people that will never give up their conscientious convictions to him. God has a mark, and that mark is the divine Sabbath. The Roman church has a mark of its authority, Sunday. And the church claims that its authority is above the authority of the Bible. If you read Peter Gehrman's catechism, it says, which day is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why then do we keep Sunday instead of Saturday? Gehrman's catechism says, because the church changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Why did the church do this? because of its authority. If you look at the Converts Catechism, very similar statements. Catholic Encyclopedia, very similar statements. You look at the statements of Edward Hiscox, author of the Baptist Manual, points out that Sunday came into the church through pagan sources, adopted by the papacy, and that it then has come into Protestantism. So the Roman church has a mark of its authority not based on biblical authority, but based on its claim that it can exalt the Sunday Sabbath above the true Sabbath of the Bible. In St. Catherine's Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995, they were discussing the issue of the Bible Sabbath and why the Catholic Church keeps Sunday rather than the Sabbath. And look at what this Catholic journal said. May 21, 1995, perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. Not quite historically accurate, happened in about the third or fourth century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scriptures. Now note, this is St. Catherine's Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995. And what's it saying? What's it talking about? It says that the church changes the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, not based on Scripture. What's it based on? We go on. But from the church's sense of its own power. People think, people who think that the Scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Isn't that an amazing isn't that an incredible statement from the monastery, from the Catholic uh, Church, saying people that want to keep Sabbath should become Seventh-day Adventists? Friend of mine, I don't know about you, but I want to follow Jesus. And I know that's why you are watching this telecast, because deep within your heart, you long to follow Jesus. Deep within your heart, you want to hang on to the truth of Scripture. Deep within your heart, you know that Jesus indeed is your Lord. Jesus indeed is your Savior. And that the Bible is your only guide. You see, the final issue is one of loyalty. The final issue is one of commitment to Christ. And the final issue will deal about worship. The issue in heaven had to do with worship and loyalty. The issue in the Garden of Eden had to do whose voice would you listen to with Adam and Eve had to do with loyalty. Down through the centuries, the human race has been tested on this area of obedience, tested in this area of loyalty, tested in this area of worship. When men and women come to Jesus, when they're saved by his grace, when they're redeemed by his love, they long to be obedient to him. You see, in every age, God has had called men and women to take a stand. In the days of the early Roman Empire, Perpetua 
Vivia, took a stand for Christ. It was not popular to take that stand in those days, not common to take that stand, but she took a stand for Christ. This young woman in her 20s would not burn incense to Caesar. Christ was her Lord. As the result of that, she was cast into prison. She had just born a baby, and the Roman authorities, the pagan Roman authorities, took that baby and held it outside of the prison bars. And she could hear her baby crying for milk, and they said, if you renounce Christ, we will open the doors of the prison, open the gates of the prison, and we will give you your baby and you can nurse it. She could not renounce Christ. They did everything they could from starving or beating her. And one day they came in and they said, you're foolish, why won't you renounce Christ? Perpetua Vivia pointed to a clay pot and she said, what's that? They said, a clay pot. She said, if we call it by any other name than a clay pot, will it make it anything else? They said, no, it's a clay pot. She said, if I'm called by any other name by a, than a Christian, I, I can't change who I am. I'm still a Christian. She died because of her faith. She took that courage. And God is calling men and women in this crisis hour of Earth's history, to take a stand. In these last days of Earth's history, God invites His people to take a stand. I have spent many weeks, months, years traveling in Eastern Europe, traveling in the former Soviet Union. I've talked to scores of men and women who've been imprisoned for their faith. I've talked to people who have suffered for their faith. I remember my dear friend Mikhail Kulikov, he's died now, this great man of faith, this tremendous man of God, who told me about his father's trial. His father was a Sabbath-keeping Adventist minister. He was tried by the communist government for what they called counter-revolutionary activities. He had baptized some young people at night. One of them was a communist informer who told on the father, said he was coerced. He wasn't, of course, but he was all, often manipulated, this young man was, by the government to do that. Pastor Mikhail Kulikov's father was imprisoned for his faith. He was tried, falsely accused, after the trial, which none of the family could be in. Pastor Kulikov told me, I went down to his cell. There was a young Russian guard about his age in his early 20s guarding the cell. Pastor Kulikov said, can I, can I talk to my father? The guard looked one way. The guard looked another way. He said, I'll give you five minutes. Pastor Kulikov went in. He said, my father embraced me. We cried and cried together. I didn't know if I'd ever see him again. I said, what did he say to you? He said, oh, son, how much I love you. Be faithful to Christ. Then he took his hand. He ran it through my hair. He said, look, the court records indicate they're going to come and arrest you next. The court records indicate that you too will be sent to prison. But don't worry, they'll cut off all your hair, but it'll grow again. Pastor Kulikov was sent to five years in prison. When I talked to him after that, his father was in one prison. He was in another prison. His brother was in another prison. His brother never made it out of prison. He died in prison. But I said to Pastor Kulikov, Pastor Kulikov, how did you survive in prison? He said, I knew there was something beyond. I knew that I was going to a land where there's no sickness, suffering, or death. I knew that God would get me through. And he said, by the way, in prison, there were many Jewish rabbis. And you know what? I took those five years that I learned Hebrew in prison, and God worked it out for good because now I've been able to translate the old Russian Bible into modern Russian because I learned Hebrew and I could translate it from the original languages. My friend, this moment, God is calling you to take a stand. This moment, God is calling you to follow his truth. This moment, God is calling you to look beyond what is to what will be, to look beyond time to eternity. God is calling you to follow him. Jesus says to you just now, do you like to live in a land where there's no sickness, suffering, and death, a land where there is no more night? Listen as Celestine sings about that glorious land, about that marvelous land, about that time that all of our trials will be over. All of our sufferings will be over. 
all of our heartache will be over and there'll be no more night. No time with thee, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream, God will make all things new. That day gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell. Evil is banished to eternal hell. No. It will be worth it on that day, my friend. Whatever sacrifice you have to make now, 
whatever commitment that God is calling you to make, whatever stand he's inviting you to take, whatever decision he's leading you to, it'll be worth it on that day. No more night, no more heartache, no more pain, no more suffering. You know, when I heard a message like this for the very first time, it really stirred me to the depth of my soul because, as I mentioned, I was brought up in a very lovely Roman Catholic home. My father had become a Seventh-day Adventist. My mother educated us in Catholic schools, but yet I began to study the Bible. I knew there was something missing in my life. I knew there was a deep down longing within that wasn't being satisfied by the traditions of the church. And I came to a point where I heard a message just like the one you've heard that really gripped me, that really moved me. And I knew I had to do something with it. I had to make a decision. To make that decision meant to step out from my friends. To make that decision meant to step out from, from much of my family. To make that decision meant to step out from everything that was comfortable for me. But I sensed the conviction of the Spirit of God. I sensed the moving of the Holy Spirit and I knew that for me personally to be faithful to Christ, I needed to make that decision. I'd like you to pray about what God wants you to do. Just forget about the influence of others. Forget about your legacy, your past. Forget about how you've been brought up. And just say, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, that's what I want to do. Ask Jesus to bring deep conviction to your heart. Be honest with Christ. Listen for his voice speaking through his word. Play fair with God. Tell him, Lord, whatever you want me to do, Make it plain to me and I'll do it because I'm dedicated to following you and your word. Why not make that decision as we pray? Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are faithful to your word. You'll never let us down. You'll guide us. You'll strengthen us for the decisions ahead. And we thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Revelation's ancient discoveries. God has an amazing plan for your life as you continue in Christ to follow him now and forever. Amen.